This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show, Edgar Wright. How you doing, Edgar? I'm good. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I, I had the pleasure of watching your hypnotic beautifully haunting film last night in soho uh yesterday and it was beautiful man it was really really it's like i was telling uh i was telling someone earlier today it's just so nice watching a film when you have a filmmaker a storyteller you're in good hands <laughs> so thank you oh, thank you. so um i wanted to jump in first and ask you what was the film that lit the fuse for you to become a filmmaker i think um well, it, it wasn't exactly a film, but it was like a documentary about a filmmaker and it was related to the films. So I was a big film fan from a very early age. And, you know, the first film I ever saw was Star Wars. So I was of that generation where, mm -hmm. you know, my parents took me, my brother to see Star Wars, um, Superman, Raiders, like Close Encounters, like, and, and I had a, a healthy interest in, in genre through that and you know and certainly through like horror and sci-fi and lots of films that i i wanted to see but wasn't old enough to see <laughs> the thing so i was always interested in 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 films and in genre but then the thing that kind of really flipped the switch in terms of i want to be a director was a documentary on british tv called the incredibly strange film show which was hosted by jonathan ross you can actually find it on youtube Nice. And they would eat, they would do, um, they would do profiles on different directors. So they'd do like Russ Meyer, Jackie Chan, George Romero, John Waters. And this is on like network TV. And then there was one episode about Sam Raimi and watching that episode. And at that point I hadn't seen Evil Dead or Evil Dead 2, but I certainly knew what they were. And, and because my parents didn't have a VCR, like it was films that I was like too young to see at that point, but also, you know, it was not like I, 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 I was able to see them even on VHS at that point. But seeing this documentary about Sam Raimi and seeing his story about being a teenage filmmaker and basically making a movie in Michigan, they just kind of blew my head off. I just thought, wow, OK, that's what I want to do. And so because around the same time, my parents had bought me and my brother a second-hand Super 8 camera. Mm -hmm. It was one of those presents which went over, you know, like a joint, like um, Christmas and birthday present. Of course. But this was like for me and my brother. So it was like one <laughs> present that went over four events. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. So my mum and dad really thought this was this was like a big deal present, and uh, so. But I, so I had this Super 8 camera and then I saw this documentary where Sam Raimi was making Super 8 films at school. And then like, you know, a matter of years later, he's making a horror movie. So I just like completely, that was the light bulb moment. And then after that, I saw Evil Dead 2 first and then later saw Evil Dead because there was a period where it was banned in the UK. It was mm -hmm. banned in I heard. video now. So that was the thing. It was sort of like Evil Dead 2, but through this documentary. So so that brings me to your to the next question, Dead Right. I how did you get how did you make it? I know it was shot on Super H, Super VHS. For everyone listening, Dead Right was one of your first short films, correct? I mean, it's not a short film. It's like 70 minutes. Long. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I mean, it's quote unquote a short film. <laughs> Um, so I, the first thing I did was make um, shorts with my school friends and, um, you know, based around like impressions of celebrities that they could do. <laughs> so I did this kind of like silly, like sort of, uh, sort of action spoof uh, that was about five minutes long. Um, I won't mention like the name of the film because the, um, the, the celebrity that it was based on her, has uh, been involved in... <laughs> Like a national scandal. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. One of those just like happily like wiped from my CV. Yes. Also, American people will understand who it is, but British people were. So I just like I'll skip over that one. Sure. So basically, I was these kind of like silly comedy shorts, and then I made an animated film um, for a, t a competition on TV about wheelchair access in cinemas uh, for for this uh, for comic relief. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and for, for this national competition and I won the competition and I won a video camera which I previously would not have been able to afford so once I got the video camera then it was around the time I was like 17 then I was really like off to the races where I started making these longer form like films with my friends at school one of which was dead right so I did like a, I did three I did the superhero movie that was called Carbolic Soap then I did a western Fistful of Fingers, not of not the, not the film version, the video version, mm -hmm. like the video version. And then the final one that I did was uh, an, it was a cop film called Dead Right, which was I shot like over like Easter's and summers, and I think there's like there's a lot of people in that movie. I kind of figured as a sort of indie filmmaker or amateur filmmaker that the more people that were in it, the more people might buy a copy. <laughs> <laughs> It's great marketing. It's great marketing. The more people are in it, more people might buy a copy and the more family members might buy a copy. So I was in like dead right. And I was only 18. I think I sold like kind of 200 copies of it at like 10 pounds each or something like that. There so, you go. So, you know, not, not too bad. Not too bad a return. Not too bad a return at all. Now, what were some of the biggest lessons you learned from shooting those early films? And I, I'm assuming dead right, by the way, was like a precursor to Hot Fuzz. I mean, I didn't know that at the time. Sure, I mean, of course. Uh, I mean, in a weird way, the thing the thing actually sort of, I think for, a, for I, I thought about kind of doing something more with Dead Right, but then in a weird way, Hot Fuzz is an inversion of Dead Right. Dead Right, there's this kind of like, without <laughs> without any like um, explanation, like my friend Edward Scotland was playing like an American cop in, you know, we're in like Somerset where I was, where I'm from. And there was no explanation for why there was an American cop in this town. But then in a weird way, the, the Hot Fuzz was sort of doing some of the same things, but just inverting it. Like, mm -hmm. so it was like doing an American style cop film in an English village <laughs> with English actors. So that to me was more interesting than the idea of just having like a sort of, you know, a, I mean, a dirty Harry Spoos had been done to death by that point, you know, but done to death when I did Dead Right, as well, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the thing that I learned, um, and this is something that I learned doing my own stuff where I was like shooting and editing myself, was a lesson that I learned that then, you know, I kind of um, didn't kind of take heed of on the next thing. But I think the thing that I learned doing the stuff on video was just about coverage and editing because I, I op on Dead Right, I operated it, I e edited it. You know, I was, I was, there was no cameraman. It was just me. I mean, whatever <laughs> tree lighting there was, it was just me. Right. But the thing is, I just knew, like, worked out very quickly what, how many shots and angles you need to edit something. Mm -hmm. And so kind of the best way of, like, learning how to direct is, like, watching your favorite movies, how they're constructed and trying to copy that, you know? So the thing that, thing, yeah, so, so that was the big lesson was just kind of learning about coverage and editing itself. How did you edit? Did you edit like between VCRs? Yeah, I crash edited, yeah. I got pretty good at it as well. <laughs> <laughs> so did I back in the day. <laughs> then I, when I went to art college, um, I went to art college to do audio visual design and um, I couldn't get onto the film course I wanted to get onto. They said I was too young and said um, I should go on this other course first, um, which was like a audio visual design, like a foundation course. But they had an edit suite there, like a tape to tape thing. And because it was in Bournemouth, which was a coastal town in the UK, it was like a beach town. Something was interesting is whenever the weather was good, nobody would be at college. Like everybody would go to the beach and the college campus would be deserted. Mm -hmm. And I took advantage of that because I think in, as you can see, I'm not really a sun person. <laughs> so I, well, whilst all of my, you know, classmates are off down the beach sunning themselves, I'm going to get in that edit. So sometimes I'd sort of take the key and I'd go in on like Saturdays and Sundays and I'd just learn how to edit. And awesome. I'd be editing dead right on that machine, tape to tape. And also I would put together compilations of film clips, like to music. And I also sometimes would re-edit um, movies. Like I had <laughs> Evil Dead when it was re-released on video was re-released uh, cut by like kind of two minutes by the BBFC. Mm. But a friend of mine at college had an uncut copy of Evil Dead, which was like ninth generation. So it was pretty gnarly. 
No. And I thought, well, if I take my first generation copy of the cut version and then I splice back in the cut bits, then it will be better than the ninth generation version. I remember telling Sam Raimi, I met Sam Raimi, I told him this story that I'd actually like spliced together my own VHS copy of Evil Dead. And I think he looked at me like I was insane. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, you, you, I mean, you obviously are a very prolific writer. How do you approach writing? Do you start with characters? Do you start with plot? What is your approach? I mean, um, usually there's a storyline. I mean, certainly in, in, in some cases, the storyline is very clear in my head, as it was with Last Night in Soho. With Baby Driver, it's like I, you sort of had, had a, a, a general idea, but it kept sort of just kind of like developing. But when I'm actually writing, I, even if I have the story, a big part of it is just kind of like, um, I would call it creative procrastination. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you're, like, in the lead up to writing, you're just like reading a lot, like reading a lot of research and listening to lots of stuff that's like, I like used to use music as inspiration. Or, you know, in, in the case of Soho, it was a lot of watching a lot of films of the period, not not horror films or thrillers, but just like dramas and documentaries about the period. Right. So it's just that thing to kind of get you in the mood. And I think there's that point where you kind of keep sort of creatively procrastinating until, you know, your treatment document gets so much bigger and bigger to the point where now I'm writing the screenplay. <laughs> so it's, it's not necessarily the most efficient way of doing something, but it's the way that I tend to work. It's a bit different when you have a co-writer because then, then you know, then it can be a bit more formal because, you know, with Last Night in Soho, which I wrote with Christy Wilson Cairns, she came on to write the screenplay with me at a point where I had the story sort of kind of pretty clear and it was all like mapped out and tons of research, but it was a matter of like then, okay, let's sit down and write the screenplay. Right. So and they, when you have a partner, they keep you honest, is basically what you're saying. <laughs> oh. I think sort of it goes both ways. I mean, I feel like somebody's always got to be good cop and bad cop. Right. I think when he, Simon Pegg, and he won't, he, 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 won't, he won't be annoyed that I say this, and, and he cannot deny it. But definitely in the writing of, like, Sean and Hot Fuzz, I was definitely good cop. I was, like, the headmaster cracking the whip. <laughs> and Simon was the one who was kind of trying to sort of negotiate down the amount of time we spent in the writing room <laughs> on a daily basis. That, <laughs> Simon is an amazing writer, so it kind of all worked out. But I always found it funny that he was always, you know, wheedling around like, hey, I might not be able to make it in until, <laughs> like, you know, so that, he's brilliant. He's, you know. Now, um, you've, I mean, you've directed some amazing action sequences, I mean, from Scott Pilgrim and obviously uh, Baby Driver. How do you approach directing some of these big set pieces? I mean, Baby Driver alone I mean, had so many car chases and like big stuff going on. How do you approach it yeah, as a director? How do you even approach going to that? I think just a lot of planning, basically. I mean, in the cases of Scott Pilgrim and Baby Driver, you know, you... I storyboard everything and you do like, and, and, and yeah, so obviously it's what's written on the page, which is almost like it's the screenplay, but it's kind of like a beat sheet of what's going to happen. Then you draw it and then working with a stunt team that is embellished, especially on something like Scott Pilgrim with like martial arts is that, you know, we would draw like the key frames, but what like the sadly late Brad Allen would do is like sort of like he, he would do the sort of like, for every frame is like kind of like five to eight beats. So, right. you know, they, they kind of like sort of like brilliantly embellish on like the drawings because you don't like literally draw every punch. With Baby Driver, like it was a sort of a more interesting situation where we have the songs and we know what the duration of the songs are. So we're kind of condensing the action into the songs, which is quite a good way to do it in a way because mm -hmm. sometimes when people, on big budget action movies, they just like shoot and shoot and shoot and just figure out in the edit and they don't really have like the kind of like the shape of the sequence. But with Baby Driver and also with Last Night Solo, which isn't action, but a similar thing, the, the scene is only as long as the song. So if you have the song kind of locked down and you know what that is, then it's like you kind of fit the story and the action into that. And it's quite a good kind of, um, gives you, you know, really hard 
like um you know kind of um limits basically so sort of you know because you're not going to start extending the music it's like let's make it fit into the song yeah so, you're backing in you're backing into it yeah exactly now um you have also done some i mean uh, your comedy and your action i mean you you're you're so known for both those elements and balancing them so well as a, as a filmmaker as a writer how any advice on how to balance comedy and action in the way that you do i mean even baby driver had especially the michael myers <laughs> sequence <laughs> you know with the with the, band, with the it, how do you balance the two i guess it's just like the comedy comes from the characters so I guess it's sort of if you've got, you know, like the characters have good voices mm. and they have th their kind of like strengths and weaknesses and their attitudes are well defined, then the comedy just comes out of that, you know. So, you know, that Michael Myers scene, this is the idea of like the sort of the one gang member who's kind of half, you know, not not quite listen to the, the brief. <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny actually, like sort of, I keep reading on the internet. It's like one of those kind of like facts, tri you know, trivia facts that goes out there and it's wrong. Like people say, um, oh, Edgar Wright wanted to use the Michael Myers mask and couldn't. Um, they wouldn't, you know, the sort of the Halloween like sort of owners wouldn't let him use it. So he asked Mike Myers instead and got the Austin Powers mask. And that that's not true. <laughs> the original The original scene was supposed to be two Michael Myers masks from Halloween and one Austin Powers mask. And that was the joke. Because even in the setup of the scene, Doc says, buy your mask separately so it doesn't look suspicious. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that they've all gone to the same shop separately and bought the mask, but one of them has got the wrong one. So that was the original scene. And then like very close to the shoot, we sort of, we, we were told that we did have the Halloween mask and then it was clear that we didn't. And to be fair to the, you know, the kind of the owners of the Halloween franchise, they just didn't want the mask to be used in a funny sequence, mm -hmm. which is fair. So as soon as I knew that wasn't happening, I called Mike Myers, who had already signed off on the Austin Powers thing, and said, "Hey, I've got a situation. I don't have the Halloween mask cleared." And I sort of, so I sort of said, "What if it was three Austin Powers masks?" And, and luckily, he was like, "Yeah, great. You know, fine." So. I guess, you know, um, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> no, no, no. That, you actually know it's perfectly, it's exactly fine. No, I think it's like you said, the characters. If the characters yeah. are well defined, you kind of just throw them together and, you know, chaos ensues and comedy ensues in so many ways. Yeah, it sort of depends on what it is. I mean, in the case of things like um, Shaun of the Dead and The World's End, it's like taking real people and putting them in a fantastical situation. Right. And of the comedy in Shaun of the Dead and, and World's End, for example, comes from sort of real grounded, quite naturalistic characters reacting to something absolutely insane. And that was always the thing is that that was the kind of the key thing with Shaun of the Dead when we were writing it and, and also trying to get it across to people was that we didn't want it to be broad. We wanted it to be real and the sort of like keep the situation keep the situation serious like mm -hmm. the zombies are like serious and scary and could kill you and there's the, the zombies aren't doing anything funny it's like the cat the human characters are, are doing the funny stuff but then even all of their reactions are we just try to ground it in what we think we would do in that situation or, or how kind of like useless we would be in that situation <laughs> right now your new film last night in soho um how did that come to be i mean that is a it's a very specific story did it come out of your dreams how, how did that come out i think it's like a sort of combination of things i mean one part of it is just having grown up with my parents record collection which was all 60s records i had this that like, box well i mean when i say i had this box they had a box of records and mm -hmm. they never seen when i was growing up play those records anymore so i sort of like you know, when I probably about as early as six or seven, kind of inherited the vinyl player and put it in my room and just would listen to their records. And they didn't have, it's funny, the record seemed to stop dead at 1972. So <laughs> there were no 70s records or early 80s records. It was just like the, the, their albums that they, they bought before. So I just used to listen to that a lot. And then through that, you start to form a perception of the decade and an obsession with it. And a, a decade that I was not born in. I, you know, like... So obsessed with the decade before you. Mm -hmm. So 
that's really interesting to me. And then, and then that kind of developed in terms of like, I kept having sort of time travel fantasies about going back to the sixties. Wouldn't it be great to go back to swing in London? Wouldn't it be great to go to this club or see this film or be at that show? And then the more I would think about it and the more it would kind of just um, become an ongoing obsession, I started to wonder why that was and whether that was healthy and was nostalgia itself like a failure to deal with the present day? Was I in retreat? So all of these things start to formulate. And then the other big inspiration, um, aside from the genre elements that are in the film, but the other big inspiration is just being in London. Like I've lived in London for 27 years and I spent more time in the Soho neighborhood than any like couch in any apartment that I've ever lived in. Mm -hmm. And that place is very sort of like compelling and somewhat disturbing sometimes in terms of it's an entertainment district. Like it's sort of the big nightlife district and right in the middle of London, it's the heart of the film and TV industry, but it also, you know, suddenly going back is kind of the heart of the underworld and the sex industry and all of these things kind of strangely sort of coexist. Like now the Soho of today is, sort of been gentrified in a way but not quite it still has that thing that after midnight the other soho starts to kind of make itself known so it's a very very interesting and odd place it literally feels a bit like at midnight like brigadoon the other soho appears and so it's a very sort of compelling and, and interesting place and i'm the sort of person who can't walk around a city and not think about the past and and you know when you're in buildings that are like hundreds of years old mm -hmm. you know i'm the sort of person like eloise in the movie who starts to wonder what these walls have seen now uh one last question what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today or a screenwriter trying to break into the business today i think it's a matter of like finding your own voice and i think the key thing is and this is a difficult thing to do the key thing is is do things that you want to do not things that you think you ought to do i mm. think sort of like just kind of chase after things that you think other people want to see rather than what you really want to do like you know you could certainly have success with that but it but it's things that are from the heart or things that are real passion of yours will always i think score kind of like higher eventually um I guess as well, like, you know, in this day and age, there's more chance of getting your work out there than ever before. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that kind of sounds like, like a pat response, but it's true just in terms of, you know, like people getting their shorts seen on, you know, kind of various digital platforms or whatever. It's like that wasn't something that existed when I was growing up. So, you know, in terms of what people can do, just on social media or even like on TikTok or whatever, or you see this kind of amazing things from people shooting stuff around the world. That didn't, I mean, I'm sure if I was like sort of like if that existed then when I was a teenager, I'd be like shooting kind of like silly comic comedy shorts and putting them online, you know? So in other words, you didn't look at Shaun of the Dead and said, where the money is, is obviously zombie comedies. And that's why I'm going to do Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> you actually did because it came from the heart. Well, at that time as well, when we first started writing it um, in sort of 2000, you know, there were there were no other zombie film. It seems amazing to, to think of this because now you can't kind of move without uh, knocking over a zombie film. Mm -hmm. But back then it was like the zombies had sort of been gone from the zeitgeist. You know, they've been sort of like died off kind of in the 90s, essentially, zombie movies. And... It was around the time when the Resident Evil games were coming out. So that's sort of what got me and Simon talking about it through the TV show we did Spaced. But when we started writing Shaun of the Dead, it wasn't like there were really any other zombie movies on the horizon at all. Um, maybe there was the Resident Evil movie was the only one. Right. And we were writing the movie. I remember that. I remember vividly Simon calling me and saying, "Hey, have you heard that Danny Boyle's doing a zombie movie?" And I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> The first time I heard of 28 Days Later. And I was so mad. I was so absolutely livid because I was like, no, we're doing a zombie film. And as it turned out, in a weird way, I when I saw the movie, which I think came out maybe like 18 months before ours, um, you know, it wasn't anything like Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> and in a strange way, it kind of probably teed us up 
you know, in the sense that, like, you know, I think in a, in a way, like, it, it, it helped Shaun of the Dead. Right. And then, you know, so it was it was actually sort of like a blessing in a way. Edgar, thank you so much for being on the show, man. I appreciate it. And uh, congrats on the new film, man. It is a fantastic feat. So continued success to you, my friend. And keep, please keep making movies. Thank you. Thanks for having me.